Alhamdulillah. <coughs> we're here again with another Jum'ah, another Friday, and we're here for the Friday prayer, inshallah. The Jum'ah, Salatul Jum'ah is a time, it's a Eid for the Muslims. It comes on a weekly basis, and it is an opportunity, it is a time for reminding each other about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about our obligations, about our commitments to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about how we can make our way through this life, inshallah, reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a good state, that we will be rewarded by Him instead of being punished by Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, in the 21st ayah, this is the very first command in the Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to humanity. And He says, Ya ayyuhal nasu, a'budu rabbakum, alladhi khalaqakum, walladhina min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells, O oh you, O oh humanity, Ya ayyuhal nas, worship your Lord. A'budu rabbakum, worship your Lord, the one who created you, and those who were before you, so that perhaps, لَعَلَّكُمْ So that perhaps you might become from the muttaqin. So perhaps, تَتَّقُونَ So that perhaps you might have some taqwa. And this is what I want to focus on today. Two things here. First, who is our Lord? I want to remind myself and all of you, who is our Lord? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a surah that's very short, and it's one of the first surahs that we all learn when we're learning to memorize Qur'an is Surah Al-Ikhlas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. So if we want to know who our Lord is, this is the surah, this is these four, these four ayat from the Qur'an will tell us who our Lord is. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say, He is Allah ahad. Unique. Singular. No partners. At all. Allahu Ahad. Allahu Samad. The one who is called upon, who calls on no one else. When you need to call on someone, when there's no one else to call on. If, you, if a person was drowning in the middle of the ocean and there was no one around, who would they call upon other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that's who you call upon when there's no one else to call upon. And he calls upon no one. That's our Lord to start off. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He has not been begotten, nor has he begotten anyone else. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not born from anyone and has not given birth to anyone else. And there is nothing that resembles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever we can think of, of what we think Allah is, that's not Allah. Whatever your mind can conceive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not Allah. So Allah, this is our Lord. He is unique and singular. He is the one who is called upon when no one else can be called upon and He calls upon no one else. He has no children and He is not the child of anyone and nothing resembles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our Lord. And our Lord, as He tells us, worship your Lord. This is who we need to worship. And why do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because He created us. And He created those who came before us, all the way back to our father Adam alayhi salam. And what's the purpose of this worship other than to be among the muttaqin, to gain some taqwa. And this is what I want to talk about. The second thing is, what is taqwa? And why is taqwa important? Let's talk about why taqwa is important before we get into the details of taqwa itself, because that's going to take a little bit of time. The importance of taqwa come from these first two ayahs that I mentioned at the beginning of my khutbah today. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, attaqu allaha wa qulu qawlan sadida, yuslih lakum a'malakum, wa yaghfir lakum dhanubakum, wa may yuti'a allaha wa rasoolahu faqada faza fawzan azima. Oh, you who believe. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking not to just all of humanity, which he talks about in, ayat al in the ayah that I mentioned from Surah Al-Baqarah. He speaks to all of humanity to worship your Lord. Now he's speaking to those who already believe. To you and me. Because we're here. We believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we didn't, we wouldn't be sitting here waiting to do our salah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and listening to my khutbah. So we're talking, yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to us. Ya ayyuladina amanu. Attaqullah. Have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa qulu qawlan sadida. And speak an upright word. 
This qawlun, qawlun sadida, the mufassirin say it could be two, one of two things. One, it could be the shahada itself. Say la ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah. That's a firm word. Sadid, like a sad, a dam, holds back an immense amount of water, a word that is sadid, a firm word, is going to hold back any falsehood. Any falsehood. And the shahada holds back all falsehoods. A second meaning it could be, qawlan sadida is to speak the truth. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, speak the truth even if it's against your own selves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in this ayah, O you who believe, have taqwa of Allah. And, Speak an upright word. Speak a strong word. Speak the truth. Allah will rect If we do this, this is an amazing two ayahs here. These are conditional sentences. Allah says, if you do two things, have taqwa and speak the truth. Speak an upright word, and Allah will do two things. He will rectify your actions. He will rectify your actions. And he will forgive you the sins that you have already committed. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has truly succeeded with the greatest success. So what is this? Why? Two conditions. If we can fulfill these two conditions, Allah will fulfill two things for us. Have taqwa. And we'll get to this, what taqwa is, we'll talk about that. But have taqwa of Allah and speak the truth. Speak an upright word and Allah will rectify your actions. What does it mean to rectify things? Anyone here who's an electrical engineer knows what rectification is. When you have a signal and you need to rectify it, you send it through a rectifying circuit and what it does is it removes any oscillations and it gives you a solid signal. When we're walking on the straight path in this life, we don't want to vacillate between good and bad and good and bad and good and bad, doing this wrong and that wrong and this wrong and that wrong, crossing over the straight path and never staying on it. We want to stay on the straight path. We want to rectify so that we're not doing wrong things, so that we see the truth, we follow the truth, and we don't get deluded and distracted from that straight path by doing things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want us to do. So when we want our actions to be rectified, we have to put some effort into it to stay away from the haram. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a promise here that if we have taqwa of Allah and we speak the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will rectify our actions. In other words, what we start doing will be on that straight path and we won't become misguided, lost. We'll stay on that straight path. And from that point on, we have nothing to worry about because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive our sins that we've committed in the past. So this is an amazing promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if we can have taqwa and speak properly, He will rectify our actions and He will forgive us our sins. And that is the greatest of successes when we can obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what is the greatest success? It's not driving the most expensive car or living in the biggest house or having the most wealth or having the most children. This dunya is going to fade away. It's going to fade away. Whatever we accumulate in this life of physical things, of material things, we can't take them with us. We can't take them with us. On the day when we die and they wrap us in our coffin and they pray on our janazah and they walk us into the grave and they put us in the ground and they bury us, they don't bury you with anything else. You can't take your wealth with you. You can't take your house with you. You can't take your children with you. They don't go with you in the grave. They stay here. The Prophet Muhammad told us that when we're buried in the grave and the footsteps of our people leave, we go into the grave with three things. You go in there with your family, you go in there with your wealth and your body. You stay and your family and your wealth walk away. Your family and your wealth walk away. So we don't take it with us. That's not success. Success is coming to the day of judgment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standing before Him and not having anything to account for to put on the scale other than good deeds. That's the ultimate success. Because from that, we will inshallah have the ability to cross the sirat over the jahannam 
and make it to the hold of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and drink from his hands and then enter into Jannah. That is the ultimate success. That is the goal. And whether anyone in this world believes that that's what's going to happen or not is irrelevant. This is what Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has revealed through his Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it is what is going to happen and we're all going to experience it. On that day, everyone will wish they can go back to do good deeds. Everyone will wish to go back so they can walk that Sirat al-Mustaqeem. Everyone will wish they could go back and speak the truth. Everyone will wish they could go back, but we can't. It's a one-way ticket. And on that day, the ultimate success is having Allah's pleasure and His forgiveness. Inna alhamdulillah Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad kama sallaita ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ali Sayyidina Ibrahim fil alamin innaka hamidu majid Allahumma barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad kama barakta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ali Sayyidina Ibrahim fil alamin innaka hamidu majid amma ba'd <coughs> So as I've already mentioned several times taqwa is really key here it's the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked of us in those two ayahs. Attaqullah. Ya ayyuladheena amanu attaqullah. And in that first ayah that I read from Surah Al-Baqarah, by worshipping your Lord, perhaps we'll gain taqwa. So I have to ask, we have to ask the question, then what is taqwa? There's a lot of ways to, to translate this word. And it's a difficult word to translate. But if we look at some of the root words of where it comes from, we can get an understanding of what taqwa is all about. The word taqwa comes from the root words waqa. Waqa means to defend oneself, to protect oneself from the harm of an enemy. The taqwa is a shield. It's like if someone was in battle and you're carrying a shield in one arm to protect yourself from the blows of your enemy while you use your sword to fight the enemy. So you need a shield. You don't go into, you don't go into a battle without a shield because you have no way of defending yourself against the throes of your enemy. And when we look at who our enemy is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly told us in the Qur'an, time and again, your enemy is shaitan. It's Iblis. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our father Adam alayhi salam, and we all know the story of the creation of Adam alayhi salam, and when he created Adam, he told the angels he was going to create and put him in the earth. And they asked, are you going to put someone who's going to shed blood? And so corruption in the earth, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I know what you don't know. We know the story, and then he turned to the angels and said, give me the names of all of these things. And they didn't know, they said, we only know what you have taught us, Ya Allah. He turns to Adam, who he's already taught the names of everything, and says, tell them the names. And they, Adam alayhi salam, tells them the names. And because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the angels to make sajda to Adam alayhi salam. And they do. But there was one who was among that group who didn't make sajda to Adam salam, and he was known, well, there's a story, there's a backstory behind Iblis. Iblis wasn't an angel. He was from, one, from among the jinn. And we know the jinn is a creation that's other than the angels and other than human beings. Human beings, we know Allah SWT created Adam salam from mud, from the soils of the earth and from the ocean's waters, made the mud which is really quite fascinating when you look at the composition of the human body, we're about 30% flesh and we're about 70% water. That's what makes up the human being. The earth itself is 70% covered by ocean waters and 30% by land, which is it's an interesting coincidence that we are the same composition as the earth itself. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the angels to create Adam alayhi salam, He commanded the angels to come down to the earth and to gather all of the soils from the earth. So we have white soil and red soil and black soil and yellow soil. All the different colors of soil from the earth were gathered and made into the mud that made Adam alayhi salam and the waters from the ocean. So it's not a coincidence that we are from the earth. And before Adam alayhi salam was created, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi that there was another creation on the earth and they did sow corruption and spill blood on the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent one of his jinn, whose name was Harith, with his jinn army to eliminate all of the corruption 
and bloodshed on the earth, and he did that. And there isn't a place on the earth that Hadith didn't make Salah. This jinn, Hadith, was Allah's favored jinn. So when he created Adam alayhi salam, and they were there, Hadith was among the, 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 the gathering, and he didn't make sajda to Adam alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him, why didn't you make sajda to him? And he said, you've made me a fire and you made him of clay, I'm better than him. And his arrogance prevented him from making sajda. His name then became, he was shatana, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sh shunned him out of that, or that, that gathering. He turned into the shaitan whose name was now Iblis. And Iblis comes from Ablasa, which means to despair. Because he has been cursed to Jahannam forever. And he then asked Allah, don't send me to Jahannam now. Wait till the end of time and then send me because I will show you that this, this, this creation that you made, Adam and Islam, and his progeny, they won't believe in you. And I'll show you that most of them won't follow your commands. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that's fine. Whoever doesn't, whoever doesn't follow, whoever follows you, I'll send you and all of them into Jahannam. So he's been, he's been given a reprieve. And now he's our enemy. He's our curse. He's here to try to cause us to do wrong. That's his job. He's doing a pretty good job. You have to admit, because the majority of people on this earth are in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we're here in defiance of him, and we're here to prove that he's wrong. And to prove he's wrong, we have our shield to protect us from his throws, because he's always throwing at us. He's one of the four enemies that we have to deal with in this life. Shaitan, Iblis is one of them. Our nafs, our own selves, is another enemy for ourselves. The dunya itself is an enemy for ourselves and our hawa, our capricious nature, our passions that come and go. These are the four enemies that we have and taqwa is that shield that protects us from our enemies. So what is taqwa? How do we see it? It's a type of consciousness that we have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at every moment of our life. It's not an easy thing to do. If you think Jannah and forgiveness and rocking the straight path is an easy deal, Sayyidina Ali said, don't sell, your, don't sell your soul for anything less than Jannah. Because Jannah is very costly and your soul is very precious. And so to get there, it's going to take something. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a trade with us. If you be a mutaqi, and I'll explain what we have to do and speak the truth, which are both very difficult things to do. Allah will give us something that's great. The following of the straight path without, without being misguided or lost or falling off of it and forgiveness for our wrong actions so that when we get to him on the day of judgment, we will have that ultimate success. So there's five levels of taqwa. The first level is to leave the realm of kufr, of disbelief, into the realm of belief by saying la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah by taking that shahada anyone who takes that shahada is now on the first level of taqwa because they have recognized who allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and that's a that's an amazing thing because the worst of the muslims is still better than the best of the non-muslim who doesn't believe in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything in creation is a muslim to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala human beings were given the freedom to choose either to believe in allah and take that shahada or not a tree is a muslim because it's doing exactly what allah created it to do a rock is a muslim because it's doing exactly what it was created to do a dog is a muslim because it's doing exactly what a dog is supposed to do the way allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it human beings are the only ones that don't act like human beings because of that freedom of choice and because we listen to these whisperings of shaitan that we start doing wrong actions but taqwa protects us from that the second level of taqwa is to not do anything that is haram in other words do, ex do whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to do as an obligation and avoid every prohibition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited us from and the obligations are few pray five times a day and a night Fast in the month of Ramadan. Pay your zakat if you have the wealth to do so. Make the hajj to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you have the ability to do so. Speak the truth. Honor your parents. These are simple things that we can do, but these are all obligations on us. And alhamdulillah, inshallah, we can do these things. And avoid the haram. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't kill someone. Don't murder someone. Don't, don't commit zina. 
fornication, don't lie, don't disgrace your parents. These are the things that we need to stay away from. If you do these things, you're at the second level of taqwa. Staying away from the haram and doing the obligations. And it takes effort. The third level of taqwa is to stay away from anything that is makru, anything that is detested. Anything that's detested. That's the third level of taqwa. The fourth level of taqwa is to avoid things that are of no benefit, even though they might be permissible to do. Like watching a movie. It doesn't benefit you one way or the other. You leave the things that are of no benefit and you do the things that are of benefit to you. Instead of wasting time watching a movie, you read the Qur'an. The fifth level of taqwa is the highest level and that is to watch out even what you think. Do you take yourself to account for your thoughts even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't? That's a high level of taqwa because then you are in complete and total consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time because you don't want to leave your thoughts away from Allah for one moment. That's a very high level that we can all struggle for probably for all of our lives before we could reach something like that. And may Allah give us tawfiq and success in reaching the highest levels of taqwa insha'Allah. So these are the things, if we have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we speak the truth, which is one of the aspects of taqwa, to speak the truth, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will promise us amazing results, following the straight path without veering away from it and having forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.